to you from the heart of New York City's harbor on Ellis Island, operated by the National Park Service. From 1892 to 1924, Ellis Island was the gateway for millions of immigrants in the United States, and today we'll walk in the footsteps of some of those immigrants and learn their stories. We'll hear from the National Park Service rangers as they share the rich history of Ellis Island and what life was like coming to America. We'll also tour the Ellis Island Immigration Museum located right behind me in the main building of the Immigration Station Complex. So there's a lot to cover today and I know you're just as excited as I am to get started, so let's begin. The United States has always been and continues to be a nation of immigrants. And it was right here on Ellis Island between 1892 and 1924 that some 12 million immigrants passed through the building behind me on their way to a new life in the United States. Some came in search of economic opportunity, others to escape political or religious oppression. Some immigrants came to rejoin family members. They all shared a common desire to build a better life for themselves and their families. As it stands today, Ellis Island is the symbol of the story of immigration and the cultural richness of this nation. Now, beginning in 1892, all third class and steerage passengers arriving by steamship to the port of New York came through Ellis Island. Most came from countries in Southern and Eastern Europe, like Turkey or Greece, Armenia and Hungary, and nearly four million came from Italy alone. For millions of immigrants, often several thousand a day, seven days a week, Ellis Island was their first introduction to America. Before immigrants could begin their new life in America, they walked up this very path and through the doors which we're about to enter together today. And can you imagine coming to a foreign country, not speaking the language with very few belongings? That's what it was like for many immigrants when they first arrived and this is where it all started. So let's go back in time inside this historic museum and relive their first experiences. Okay, imagine you're brand new to this country. You walk into this huge building. There are so many people and a total stranger in uniform starts telling you what to do. Scary, right? Well, when immigrants entered the building, they were directed to the baggage room. They left their trunks and suitcases and baskets and then made their way to this staircase. Now, Although it isn't the original, this modern staircase was built for the museum to remind us that it played a very important role in the Ellis Island inspection process. You see, what many immigrants didn't know was that climbing the steps was the first part of the process on Ellis Island, and that there were doctors already observing them from the second floor to ensure that they appeared physically healthy. Once they got to the top of the stairs, they entered the main hub of the immigration station called the registry room, or the Great Hall great because it could hold a population of an entire village from the old country. It was here in the registry room that all immigrants were inspected and questioned to determine whether they were fit to enter the country or whether their case required further review. Now, as immigrants entered the Great Hall, doctors conducted a six-second physical examination, checking them for problems walking or breathing, signs of heart trouble, infectious diseases, mental illness, anything that might make them a public health risk. If they were suspected of any illness, they were marked with a piece of chalk and pulled out of the line for further examination. The Great Hall was lined from end to end with hard wooden benches. Now, immigrants waiting in line moved slowly but steadily towards an inspector waiting for them behind a desk, much like this one, where eventually their name would be called and they were asked a series of questions like, where were you born? What's your occupation? Who paid your passage? Have you ever been convicted of a crime? How much money do you have? And through it all, they wondered, will I be allowed to enter America? After the physical exam and all those grilling questions, immigrants found themselves here at the top of these stairs, otherwise known as the stairs of separation. They were faced with three separate possibilities. The aisle on the right, was for immigrants who were cleared and traveling further west or south. This left staircase was the path to New York City and points north. The center aisle, now, that was the one to be feared. For those immigrants being detained for legal or medical reasons, this center staircase led to the dormitory or hospital where they were faced with a longer stay on Ellis Island, one that could easily stretch into days or even weeks. 
Those not passing inspection would have a final opportunity to have their case heard before a board of inquiry in one of three hearing rooms. And waiting for me inside this hearing room are three National Park Service Rangers who will tell us all about what coming to America was like for so many immigrants. Let's go inside. Hey guys. Hey. How are you? Great. Wow. How are you doing? Well, we just finished our tour of the Immigration Museum and now we're going to find out more about what coming to America was like for millions of immigrants and to do that we need you. So I want everybody watching to welcome National Park Service Rangers Catherine Crane, Peter Wong, and Melissa Magnuson Kennedy. Hey, welcome. welcome. Actually, I should say <laughs> welcome. Welcome, welcome here, welcome. right? Yes. This is actually the very first virtual field trip to Ellis Island. And now I know you guys are the experts when it comes to Ellis Island, but before we dig deeper into some of the historical events that took place here, I want everybody watching to really understand what the National Park Service is and the very important job that you guys do as National Park Service Rangers. Well, the mission of the National Park Service is to preserve and protect those very special places that are unique. They make up our cultural and historical heritage and embrace our natural wonders. So we want to take care of these places. And as park rangers, we also want to invite everyone to come out and personally visit them and experience them, them themselves. Well, and speaking of national parks, there are a number of them across mm -hmm. the country. How, mm -hmm. About how many? We're almost to 400. And what are some of the really famous Oh, uh, You've heard of Yellowstone, the very first one. That's right. If you go south, you'll find Everglades. Way up north on the east coast is Acadia. Out west is Mount Rainier. Very cool. Now, you know, the National Park Service has worked really hard to preserve the cultural value of this site, Ellis mm -hmm. Island. And I know most of us think of Ellis Island as an immigration station, but what we don't know is that there is a really interesting history. For example, the wooden structure that was built in 1892 to house the immigration, immigration station actually burnt down five years later, and it took another three years to rebuild what is this modern structure in right now, this building that we're in, and that opened in 1900. Now, Michelle Higgins, third grade class from Midland Elementary School in Paramus, New Jersey, is watching today. Hey, guys. And they want to know what was on this island before it became an, immigra an immigration station. Let's watch. Our class is here in Paramus, New Jersey. We know some of Ellis Island is in New Jersey, and the rest of it is in New York. Can you tell us a little about Ellis Island before it was run by the government? What roles did it play in history? <laughs> well, it had a lot of roles in history. When the Native Americans were here, there was a great bountiful harvest in the harbor of fish. So they were fishing out here on the island, and they referred to it uh, as the name of Gull Island. Mm -hmm. That's how we would say it today. Later on, it was a place where there was a private tavern. Mm -hmm. um, they were hanging pirates for a little while. We called it pirates. Anderson Island or Pirate Island. Wow. And we know it because the last private owner was Samuel Ellis. So Ellis's Island became Ellis Island and that's how you know us today. Now, but in the 32 years between 1892 and 1924, what we know is that 12 million immigrants arrived and were processed through Ellis Island. Now, they came from different countries, they had different customs, different beliefs, and they spoke a lot of different languages. But they all shared one common aspiration, didn't they? To begin a new life in a new world. From all of your records, what was the journey to America like for most of them? Well, for many immigrants, the journey was actually very long. Not only did they take that couple-week trip across the Atlantic on a steamship, but they also had to get to that port city. And so for many people, they walked. Many people took maybe horses and carts and trains to the port cities. So it's a very long journey. Long journey. Now, Melissa, your great grandparents actually arrived from Sweden, right, in 1910. And they must have shared some great experiences with your grandfather and maybe even your parents. What were some of the stories that you remember? Yeah, absolutely. Memories are meant to be shared. And so I, I do know some of the stories of their lives. Um, unfortunately, I don't really know too many stories about their actual immigration. Um, but from primary documents like manifests, I actually get to learn a little bit more about them. And I also have a photo of, their, of them on their wedding day. So it's really special to me. That's lovely. Um, all the immigrants came with luggage. And behind me here is a real trunk. I love this. It's made of pine. And it was 
uh, owned by a Polish immigrant, I'm told, who arrived in 1912. Uh, now, we know that before they were processed, Im immigrants had to actually leave the bags that they arrived with in the baggage room. Now, Gina Connell's third grade class from Leonard Elementary in Troy, Michigan. Hey, guys, they're watching, and they have a question specifically about the baggage. Let's listen. The last time my family and I went on vacation, we could only take one or two bags on the plane with us. Was there a limit to the number of bags the immigrants could bring with them? I was also wondering what sorts of things the immigrants brought with them to America and how much money they usually came here with. A lot of good questions there. Yeah, absolutely. Many immigrants actually travel to Ellis Island with whatever they could carry. You know, many travel to America with uh, their favorite toy, religious artifact, and a lot of other things that carried a lot of personal meaning. And while officials actually um, had $25 that each immigrant should carry on the manifest record, it wasn't necessarily required by law. And since they were coming here to a new land, they literally just put whatever they could bring with them. So whatever they could fit in that trunk, that's what they brought. So it wasn't a limitation, though. It was just, what can you bring? That's what you're going to bring with you. Yeah, absolutely. It's practical concerns. I'm thinking that their first moments here in America have to be pretty scary, a little bit confusing. How, how did the Ellis Island inspectors deal with all the sort of different circumstances they were faced with? Um, how did they actually maintain order? Well, if you think back to the first day of school, when yeah. you're leaving school and you're going back out to get on the bus and you're not really sure where that bus is parked, everyone there is there to help you. Or if you walk, maybe we were at the movie theater and there are lines already set up to make sure you're in the right place. And the inspectors here at Ellis we're here to help you get through this process as quickly and as easily as possible and then start your new life in America. But they're coming here speaking so many different languages where they're translators. Yeah, Ellis Island marked the first time where uh, there were volunteers from the local churches, synagogues. They also hired interpreters as well. So uh, many uh, immigrants had a lot of resources available to them when they arrived. I imagine some came a little hysterical, screaming children. How would they calm them down? Um, many, I'm glad you brought that up because many immigrants actually recalled seeing uh, sandwich men, milk ladies who would actually come by, you know, while waiting three, four hours online and they would actually calm them down by giving them food. That is really cool. See, these are the great stories. I love these stories. Um, but there's one in particular that I want to bring up and I know it's going to be relevant to all of you guys watching out there. It involved a young girl who was traveling from Ireland. Uh, with her two younger brothers and without her parents, and her name was Annie Moore. And this is cool. She was actually the first immigrant to be processed on Ellis Island on January 1st, 1892. She was only 15 years old. I need to hear about her story. It's a great story, and we really know quite a bit about Annie Moore because being the first immigrant here, she was met by the superintendent of immigration who actually handed her a $10 gold piece. Cool. And that got a write-up in the local papers, so we actually have a document where you read that she was age 15. But if we go back to her manifest, it says she's actually 13. And her family, her descendants, have recently discovered her birth record, and they believe her to be 17 years of age. So there's a lot we know about her, but even our primary documents leave us a little questioning. So without computers or a passport, we just don't know. There's also a great story I read about that said that there was a very kind and courteous German mm -hmm. passenger on, on the steamship Nevada, which she arrived on, who, and he actually let her and her brothers pass in front of her, which is how she became the first the person very first to be processed. Person. Right, which is interesting. How much do we know about her life here in America? Well, she's a great story because what we found out a few years ago is we didn't know as much as we thought. Right. We thought that she had left here, moved to Texas, and raised a family and passed on there. But we discovered, or actually we didn't, it was a genealogist doing the homework, realized that there's more than one woman in the United States named Annie Moore. And okay. our <laughs> Annie Moore came through here, Ellis Island, and then settled here in New York. She had 10 children, and she passed on and is buried here in Queens. Very interesting. Now, there, there have to be countless other stories like this. Uh, people who were processed in this way through Ellis Island. What's one of your favorites? 
Well, besides my great grandparents' story, yes. of course, um, there was a girl by the name of Carmina de Simone, mm -hmm. who, like Annie, was the first something. Now, she was actually the first immigrant to be processed in this new building. So the building we're currently in, it opened in 1900. She was the first immigrant through, and there wasn't all the fanfare, but she was the first immigrant through, and I think that's really interesting, mostly because it shows a shift in where immigrants are coming from. Because, of course, Annie was from Ireland, from Northern and Western Europe, and that's where you had a lot of immigrants prior to Ellis Island. But during Ellis Island's time and after, um, immigrants are coming from different places. So for the most part, from for Ellis Island, a lot of immigrants are actually coming from the Southern and Eastern Europe, like Italy. Right, and Carmina was from Italy, exactly. where my gra great grandparents came from. And I think we learned that there were about 4 million immigrants that arrived through Italy alone. Now, Annie and Carmina successfully made it through the process. They entered America. They started a new life. That wasn't always the case for everybody, right? Um, well, I have another question here from Michael Witt's fourth grade class from Alpharetta Elementary in Alpharetta, Georgia. Hey, guys, this is what they want to know. Let's listen. What would be a reason that would cause the Immigration Department to turn away an immigrant and send him home? And were families broken up by the fact that some immigrants were turned away? Studying, too, while they're asking questions. It's a great question. Good question. Here at Ellis Island, we're worried about people making a living, paying their bills, and actually getting to their next destination. You were here at Ellis, but this isn't where you're going to end your visit. Mm -hmm. You're moving further into the country. We want to make sure that once you arrived here in the United States, you could support yourself, you could get a job and pay your bills, and not be a burden to the people already here. But also, one of the things I touched on earlier on the tour was um, the six-minute uh, medical examination. And I wanted to elaborate a little on that because our students are really interested in knowing about this medical exam in particular. Daryl Bryan's fourth grade class from Palm Avenue Elementary. Hey, guys, you guys are coming to us from San Bernardino, California. Let's listen to their question. Can you tell us about what the doctors were looking for when they examined the immigrants? <laughs> I like the little lab coat. That's very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, doctors actually played a huge role here at Ellis Island. So doctors are looking for two things. They were looking to make sure the immigrants entering the United States were healthy enough to work so that they could support themselves and their families. Two, though, they wanted to make sure that immigrants entering the United States didn't have any contagious diseases that they were bringing in. It was a huge fear. Um, still is, really. Right. Um, 100 years ago, at Ellis Island's time, they were really concerned about a disease called trachoma. So trachoma, most people have never heard of it unless they're studying Ellis Island, and that's because it no longer exists in the United States. It still exists in different parts of the world. It causes blindness, and it's very contagious. And back in Ellis Island's time, that was a big problem. Mm. To check for trachoma, you'd have to look at the underside of the eyelid. So that sounds kind of scary, um, oh, mostly oh. because... Oh boy. The doctors would use what's called a button hook. It was never meant to be a medical instrument. It's meant to button buttons, but the doctors figured out that they could use this to help flip eye lights inside and out. They would use the actual hook to flip? Um, more like the, maybe the curved bottom part of the hook or the rod, just to kind of place it against maybe near the eyelashes and then use the finger to kind of pull the eyelid up and over. I was going to volunteer, but I think I'll pass. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Earlier, I talked a little bit about the stairs of separation, actually, where immigrants were actually divided into three groups, depending on where they were going or, as I said, if they were being detained. What happened when immigrants didn't actually meet the requirements to enter into this country? Uh, when immigrants uh, walked down the center aisle, uh, many were de detained for uh, legal and medical reasons. Mm -hmm. If they were detained for medical reasons, the United States Public Health Service would actually um, treat many of these patients at little or no cost uh, to the immigrants themselves. And so they would stay in the hospital here on the site? Absolutely. Almost like quarantine. But what if there were other reasons for them to be detained? What would happen then? Wouldn't there be, a, they'd have it sort of the ability to be able to hear their case, right? Um, so I know that we're sitting here in the hearing room, or what you guys call the Board of Special Inquiry, and there were, what I was told, 10-minute sessions in here where the immigrants were able to plead their case, right? And, and isn't it true also that friends and relatives could come and speak on their behalf? What happened in this room? Well, absolutely. This is your second chance. If anything, any of the inspectors had a legal question about you, this was your chance to explain yourself further. And to help you, they would actually send a telegram 
to your final destination and invite your family or a representative or ask you to send a letter to right. kind of speak up on your family's behalf. So the alien, they're not citizens yet, would sit here and three legal inspectors in the chairs behind us would follow up on that question that caused problems to begin with. We also had a recorder. We had to write everything down, which is why we know that on average they were 10 minutes and a translator if needed. So it almost feels like in here, it was almost like a trial going on. It really like, was. Yeah. It really was. The difference was that as since you're not a citizen yet, you don't have any of the rights that we know right. and that many people came for. All right. Now I know, and we've talked about this, that there are a lot of common misconceptions about what took place here on Ellis Island. And there are a few myths that you would like to dispel. So we're going to play a little game of fact or fiction. And you guys watching can play along. And the first question or the first fact or fiction is this fact or fiction. 20% of immigrants who arrived on Ellis Island were turned away and sent home. Well, that is actually fiction. Fiction. So 20% were detained here. So about one in five of those 12 million immigrants did stay on Ellis Island for a little bit longer, days, weeks, mm -hmm. sometimes months, um, where they would get medical care or wait for their hearing. Um, really only 2% were actually denied entry and sent back. So those other 18% eventually made it in, it just took a little bit longer. All right, so I'm doing the math in my head, so 2%. So of the 12 million, about 250,000 were actually sent home. Yeah, so a lot of people, but a small percentage of that 12 million. Think about 12 yes. million, yeah. All right, so here's the story. My great-grandfather, as I said, arrived from Italy. He came on June 18th, 1905. Now, my grandfather, my mom's father, swears that their name was shortened here on Ellis Island. So fact or fiction was this common practice? That also is fiction. So names were certainly changed, but not here on Ellis Island. Here on Ellis Island, the inspectors were looking at these manifests, these names that were written down already, and using that to verify information. So really, if there were misspellings, someone else wrote that. It wasn't the officials here. Also, many immigrants actually changed their names after they entered the United States, uh, maybe as became citizens, to just fit in a little bit more. But you brought up something interesting, because the ship's manifest was what the inspectors were using, and there may have been a misspelling, or they may have had it, it may have been difficult to read the name. Exactly, the yep. Manifest. They were all handwritten up through about World War One, and then they started to be typed. Tight. But still some of those same issues with the typing. All right, one more fact or fiction. Fact or fiction, class structure affected the process for arriving immigrants? Fact. Wow. Absolutely. The amount of money you could spend on a ticket made the difference. If you were in a first or second class compartment, you never even set foot on Ellis Island. You were inspected medically and legally on the ship itself. It's only those folks in the third class or steerage class that we were concerned about that came here to Ellis for a really thorough inspection. So they were ferried over from the boat mm -hmm. to the island. Because mm -hmm. those big steamships couldn't fit here in the right. slip. All right, so we've been talking a lot about the process, right? What happened mm -hmm. when, when immigrants arrived and they were processed mm -hmm. through Ellis Island. But the journey, actually, for these immigrants didn't actually end here from, for most of them, actually. And we have a question from Kelly Evelis, fourth grade class from Willow Grove Elementary in Poway, California. Hey, guys. And they want to know what happened after immigrants were processed. Let's listen. What happened when the immigrants left Ellis Island? Was there a meeting place for them to find their friends and families? Where did most of the immigrants go, and how did they get there? Very good questions. Yeah, Peter? absolutely. Um, many immigrants actually met family members that they hadn't seen in years at the bottom of the stairs of separation. Uh, now, some elected to take a ferry to Lower Manhattan. Uh, those that decided to travel farther would actually purchase a train ticket if they haven't already, uh, and then take a boat to Jersey City off to their next destination. Now, if you didn't come here with um, any family members, they had immigrant aid societies who, who will assist you. They'll help you find housing, they'll help you find jobs, and they'll help reunite you with people of your nationality. You know, many immigrants, in fact, go through and use the similar uh, resources today as well. That's interesting. And speaking of today, I mean, I, I, wanna, I wanted to fast forward a little bit to today because if we look at the cultural landscape of America today, um, I wanted to ask you why you thought this period in time that we've been discussing was so significant, so influential, actually. 
Well, it's so influential because so many people came through in such a tight amount of time and they settled all over the country. And while many of them really wanted to Americanize their names, be more like Americans, they still brought their foods, their traditions, those slang words you still say at home over with them. And that is still very prevalent today as well as in history. So really, specifically, even those 32 years between 1892 in 1924 helped actually change the landscape mm -hmm. of what America looks like today mm -hmm. in many ways. Many, hopefully. many yeah. Americans today can trace back one or more family members to New York Harbor, Ellis mm -hmm. Island, and uh, that, that is a great influence on the country. All right. While we've been talking here, some questions have been coming in live, and I'm going to ask a few of those right now. Um, this first one is from Alicia Zimmerman's class in PS33 right here in New York City in Chelsea. Hey, Chelsea. Uh, you've been focusing on years 1892 to 1924. What happened on Ellis Island after 1924? It's a good question. Yeah, the, uh, after actually 1920, immigration laws start to, started to change, and they changed how immigrants were processed. So all of a sudden, instead of coming to an immigration station like Ellis Island, you would actually be processed overseas, kind of similar to how it is today. And so by the 1940s, 1950s, really hardly anyone was coming through Ellis Island, certainly not in the numbers that we saw before. And since this is a big government installation, the government decided to shut it down. And, and really, you know, by the 60s especially, many immigrants were arriving by plane anyways. That's they right. wouldn't have come over on a steamship. Very few by steamship. Okay, here's another live question. It's from uh, Susan Bartle's third grade class at North Verdemont Elementary in California. Hi, guys. And they want to know, when immigrants were turned away, did they have to pay their own way back to their homeland? Great Good question. question. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, they did not. The steamship company that brought them was responsible for them until they were allowed into the United States. So if for any reason they needed to go back, the steamship company had to take them back. Very cool. All right, we have one more live question. It's from PS212 in Queens. Danielle Mahoney is the teacher, and they want to know, if oh, this is a good question. If people came with money from another country, would they exchange their money for American dollars here on Ellis Island? That's yeah. a good question. Yeah, they actually had a currency exchange station here on site, you know, with different languages. So a lot of the conversion uh, would take place here as well. So there's a little currency exchange right here on the island. That's really so interesting. Nice. You know, We've been talking about national parks, Ellis Island being one of them, and so many millions of people visit national parks on a yearly basis. You said two million alone come to Ellis Island each year. What is it that you hope children and teachers and families who visit are taking away with them? I really, it's really important to me that they take away this power of the place, to actually be in this historic space, or maybe be in this really beautiful natural space. And just really take that with them, just how powerful that is. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, and each of our national parks is created because it's unique. It's a very special, one-of-a-kind place. And I hope that while they're here in person or visiting us virtually, they can gain a deeper understanding uh, and a personal connection to the space they're in and then take that with them when they leave. Yeah, it's good, too. Yeah, yeah I want our visitors to see immigration as a timeless story. I mean, today, uh, many people see immigration today either in their families, their communities, their schools, local businesses. And today, many immigrants arrive with many of the same dreams and aspirations as those 100 years ago. And when they come to a site, I want them to actually uh, find these connections. And I think many will be surprised with the similarities that they'll find. Well, you say the dream. And, and I have to say, in all of my visiting here, I couldn't help but feel the power of the American dream. It almost permeates the entire island, the facility, the museum. It's just everywhere. And right before the webcast, I was noticing some kids who were just so excited to be discovering a part of their ancestry here on the island. So it's, 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 it's extraordinary. I, I really want to thank you all for joining us here today. I want to thank you guys all for joining us today on this virtual field trip back in time. I especially want to thank the Ellis Island Immigration Museum and the National Park Service. You guys have allowed us access to a treasure trove of information and, uh, and knowledge. And I think we're all so lucky that this important piece in American history still exists and that there are people like you and all of you, Rain Park, all the National Park Service Rangers who are here to preserve them for generations to come. So thank you so much. Now, before we leave today, 
I want to encourage all teachers and students to visit scholastic.com slash immigration because you are going to find, speaking of treasure trove, a treasure trove of other great resources online, including great stories of the past, articles, activities, student activities, photos, documents. There's even an oral history scrapbook so that you can begin to document and preserve your own life's history. And finally, the next time you find yourself in New York City, I urge you to visit Ellis Island and this immigration museum. It is truly extraordinary and there is so much to see and learn and who knows you may find a piece of your own family's history waiting for you here so from all of us at scholastic ellis island and the national park service i just want to say thank you for watching today and we'll see you soon take care all right hi ladies i hope you all enjoyed that does anybody have any stories of their own from Ellis Island or any stories that they've heard, you can unmute yourself. Um, let me see. Anyone? Anyone have any stories? I have a story. Oh. I can't see me, but I have a story. Who's that, Carol? Can you hear me? I have, I have. Yeah. Okay, so let Carol go first, and then Rita, you could say your story. Go ahead. I know my. Okay. I, I know my my grandmother, may she rest in peace, uh, said that she came on the boat with, I believe, Rabbi Jacob Casson, and she koshered the kitchen wow. so that he could eat. Wow. Yeah, that's so interesting. <laughs> I have a story. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Shula, can I talk? Yeah, go ahead, Rita. Yes. Okay, my mother came to the United States as an 11 year old. Her sister sold their bangles for a one way pledge to come as a second bra, a second wife to a man because her parents were assassinated by Arabs. And when she came to the United States, they, they were questioned by the authorities and they found out that she was only 11, could not be his bride. And she was taken in by the Jewish Aid Society and given to a Jewish family to, to help raise her. And as a result, she had, a, she had to behave according to the laws of the state of New York and could not marry until she was 18. And she lived with a Jewish family and, and the Jewish aid society. She helped with the settlement house and all of that. And uh, she was very involved in the Jewish laws and those people who helped people who didn't have families at that time. Wow. Um, that's very much in keeping with what they were talking about, how those people would come to the boats and find the like people who had non-families and, but they gave her to a J-Dub family, not, a, not an S-Y family. Right, well, yeah, that's really so interesting. That's crazy. Anybody else? Anybody else have anything to say? <laughs> If not, um, okay. yeah. Shula, yeah. what's this? I can hear you. My mom wants. My mom came here when she was nine years old, and she wanted to say that her, they came in steerage, and my grandmother was the cook for everybody who was in, who was kosher, who was in the steerage. <laughs> and they, they stayed on Ellis Island. And my, my grandmother, you know, my grandfather was a rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Gindi. So my, that's why my mom was, my, my grandma was the cook. Maybe. And they had to stay on Stella, uh, Ellis Island for two weeks because my aunt uh, Gita Sultan had a mark on her face and they didn't know what it was. And they were about, they were afraid they were gonna send them back but after two weeks, they determined that the mark on the face was just a 
scar from the water that they think from the water and they finally let them in um, after two weeks into into New York. Do you, right, story. Them? Do you think, uh, no, think no. they're related to Carol's mom or who was it that? Because she also was the co Who? Carol also just who? said that, that um, yeah. Yeah, no, my 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 grandparents came before Rabbi Kassim. They came in 1929. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, hopefully, hopefully, when this is all, I'll be able to actually go visit Ellis Island in person. Suna. Yes, Mary. Until what? Until what year was the Ellis Island? Until what year you have to pass? What year was the last year? I'm honestly not sure. Oh, okay. I, I, came I had a question. <laughs> sure. Uh, I was on the phone when they talked about people changing their names and shortening mm -hmm. their names. Mm -hmm. Was it true? Did that happen? Yes. What happened is the customs what people they, did not, I can answer that one. The people at customs, they didn't understand. So let's say if a person said, my name is Lescombe, they said Cohen, they said yes. That's how there's so many Cohens and Goldbergs, because the people, the customs people were Irish and they didn't understand the foreign languages. That's why a lot of the names were changed. Well, that's why the Mizrahi family has Mizrahi, Mizrachi, East, Eastman, and they're all the same family, but they all have different uh, derivations of the same last name. It depended on who interviewed them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. Anybody else has anything they want to share with us? Any can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, it's Carol. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I know my in-laws came. They are, um, their name is Elazar HaKohen. So they came in as Cohen. And I, I think that happened to like Levy's and right. Israel. The, the last title, they just wrote down, you know, the Cohen, the Levy, whatever. Yeah, a lot. Of, I feel like a lot of people's last names got touched. Right. Yep. And the thing with the money was there not was there not a set amount of money that they had to bring with them to get into the country? Wasn't it twenty five dollars? I never heard that. <laughs> Did anybody know or hear of a denomination that was necessary? That sounds that sounds like a lot of money. Yes. Yes, it was. No, that sounds like a. Did anybody hear any number in today's in, in today's uh, film about the denomination? I didn't that hear was anything. Required? Okay, we could we could you. look it up. If I had a computer, I would. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to know how, how much money did they have to have? That's what I'm asking. What was them. what was the necessary money one had to bring in order to enter the country? Let me see. It says here. And then if they brought it in a different, if they brought it in dinars, was it translated to American money? And what you know, what was the equality? So Thank here. Even though the average cost of a ticket was only thirty dollars, um, larger ships could hold from 15 to 2,000 immigrants, 1,500 to 2,000 immigrants, um, and they netting a profit of 45,000 to 60,000 for a single day a one -way, on a one-way voyage. The cost to feed a single immigrant was only about 60 cents a day. So look, imagine how much their profit is. <laughs> I was amazed. Go ahead. I, I just, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just looked it up. It was $25 to be admitted to Ellis Island. Right. Yeah, I'm reading that. Uh, $25 okay. per person. $25. Per person? I will, I'll continue looking that up while you all speak. Because that's why many people have to leave their families. 
It's per person. They said it on the video that we watched. Oh, okay. Okay. Very interesting. Many husbands had to leave their wives because they couldn't pay passage for their wife. Wow. They would go to the Golden City and earn work like slaves to get the money to bring their wives to the country three or four years later. Wow. I was amazed at the amount of Italians that they brought the first couple of years. That number staggered. And I guess it was different ports that they came to, not just New York. Right. Well, that was, I think they, they were the ones Boston. who were willing to come first, I guess. Right, right. Amazing. Amazing. By the way, Rita, did you ever get your shot? Yes, I got it. Thank God. Oh, good, good. Baruch Hashem, yom yom. <laughs> I was worried about you, thinking about you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I'm trying to get one for my mother now, but I don't know how to do it. What did what did you do? Did you did Walgreens, you go to the hello? Walgreens yeah. drugstores are now having the yeah, vaccine. But she's, I can't yeah, but you have to sign up. I don't that I don't I gotta get somebody sign me up. The way I did it was we went to the New Jersey Board of Health website. We signed up at the New Jersey Board of Health website. Once we were there, they sent us back a paper that we were signed up. And then they gave us seven different places where we could apply. We applied to each of the seven and we got a response from a hospital because of my illnesses and my husband's illnesses. Right. And that's that how, how it worked yeah. for us. And, but you have to apply to as many places as possible. You have to right. switch so once right. once Jersey accept you. Yeah, but I'm in New York. Yeah, my mother's to apply in New York. To as many places you have to apply in New York. And she's not mobile. New York, she's not the same very, way. very elderly she and she's not mobile. My God bless them. <laughs> times is 91 years old and I was so you have to write to the the, the New York government.com and see where they're uh -huh. asking you to submit and they'll give uh -huh. you places to submit and then you have to just keep on writing the the forms and then they'll eventually tell you where they're giving the shots and that's where you have to go right. and sometimes okay. they're very far away my neighbor had to go 45 minutes away for her shot. Really? Wow. Yes. Okay. And then, did you, you only took one or you took two? Oh, no, I only had, and I did not have a good reactor. Oh, oh really? <laughs> wow. But thank you for.